Nature Farm is actually great. Okay, I'll get to it. I'll see you later. Good morning, everybody. If you're just walking in, just a reminder, there are handouts in the front. Um, I believe one of the elders or deacons may be walking around passing them out. Those are for people who want to take notes, or if you just want some sources that you can go home and fact check and read up on yourselves, I highly recommend that as well. It is Sunday morning. Uh, this is my, I believe, my third session with you guys. Yes, it is. It's quoted up there. And now I'm starting to see the consistent faces and I know you guys are not grumpy, although you may look grumpy, but now I'm starting to realize that it's morning time. So and I'm the first person you have to see in the morning. So uh, Lee has an easy job because I warm you guys up before Lee. So thank you guys definitely for coming in. It is a little cold, so if I start to rub my hands or something, I'm just trying not to turn into an icicle in front of your face. But either way, we're going to share some knowledge to you guys. We're going to be talking about how to uh, speak with Muslims and really reason with them through the scriptures. Um, as always, we quote from the Bible, the Quran, and the Hadith, and we're going to go from there. So as you can see, the topic of the of discussion today is, does the Quran teach immorality? So that word immorality, the root word is moral. And what are morals? In general, morals are generally defined principles that teach us right from wrong, good or bad, positive or negative. Keep in mind, I have said generally defined principles. This means in general, regardless where you go from south to east, east to west, coast to coast, these morals are generally defined as being either right or wrong, good or bad, positive or negative. So before we jump into what are some of these morals that we see as good or bad? Let's just give you guys a brief background history on Muslims. Because like I told you on the first session, the goal of this class is not to attack the character or the actual person from Islam. It's more to look at the book, the predecessor, and what the religion actually teaches. So a little bit of background about Muslims. Most Muslims believe in the traditional nuclear family structure with Allah at the head, the children submit to the wife, the wife submits to the husband, and the husband submits to Allah. The men are very hardworking and, are, and typically spend countless hours working to provide for their family. Muslim women are usually in charge of maintaining the household and educating their children. Muslim children are either homeschool or private school, although some, um, in, um, they come in anomalies, they might actually attend public schools. They perform extremely high academic level, their children spend most of their day studying language, sciences, arithmetic, and they start memorizing the entire Quran by the age of five. Muslim children are normally very disciplined and make up a tiny fraction of the world's youth degeneracy. Some speculate is that, some speculation is that they act out of fear of disappointing their father or worse, disappointing Allah. When you meet Muslims, they are typically some of the most humble and kind people you will ever come across. They tend to be very active within their community, whether it be through charity or owning businesses. Hygiene, good health, and eating a well-balanced diet is also a huge part of their culture. The reason I'm letting you guys know this is because when you go out in this world and you encounter Muslims, I don't want you to be under the depression that the verses and things that we talk about is something that most of them abide by because you'll be confused because these are gonna be the nicest people ever. In fact, they may be nicer than some of our Christian brethren. So therefore, I want you guys to be able to understand that. So these aren't people that we're attacking. These are our, these are our people at the end of the day and we, they need to hear the truth just like everybody else. So right here, I have a painting. The name of this painting is called The Truth Coming Out of the Well by Jean-Leon Jerome. So this parable goes, um, and also with the, with, the, um, with the painting, I put a parable. And the parable is called the parable of the truth and the lie. And it reads, the lie said to the truth, let's take a bath together. The well water is very nice. The truth, still suspicious, tested the water and found out it really was nice. So they got naked and bathed. But suddenly, the lie leapt out of the water and fled, wearing the clothes of the truth. The truth, furious, climbed out of the well to get her clothes back. 
But the world upon seeing the naked truth looked away with anger and contempt. Poor truth returned to the well and disappeared forever, hiding her shame. Since then, the lie runs around the world dressed as the truth. And society is very happy because the world has no desire to know the naked truth. So brothers and sisters, as we discuss these things this morning, the reason I'm telling you is because the average Muslim, when you conversate with them, they may not know any of these things. And when you speak to them about it, they may say that you're lying. They may think that you're trying to blast them and be disrespectful. But in reality, you're just reading their holy book and what they're supposed to know and believe. But most of them aren't taught these things. And when they are taught these things, they're taught, don't ask questions. That is a sign of uh, disobedience. You're, you're questioning Allah. You're questioning God's judgment. You're questioning God's authority when you ask these questions. So therefore, they're very unfamiliar with these topics for the most point. But it's important for us to become very familiar. Yes, sir. Yes, you will. Yes, because you're questioning Allah, so you would be considered a blasphemer according to them. Um, it's typically punished by the imam or also the parents. So I've had many Muslim encounters where they say, yes, I asked my imam about this verse you brought up, and they say, hey, don't question. Like, that's, that's God. You don't question God. Yes? So they are taught to memorize the Quran word for word, verse by verse, but they are typically not taught the context. And there are a few verses that we're going to talk about tonight, and we're going to quote them in full context, and we're going to tell how most Muslims and Quran readers will say we're quoting it out of context. So we're going to show you the context as well. So for the first one, does Islam make it lawful for you to sleep with female captives, we talked about this last week. That's Quran chapter 4, verse 24. The verse reads, also forbidden are married women except female captives in your possession. This is Allah's commandment to you. So in this section, they're talking about what is lawful sexual relations, what is unlawful sexual relations. And this specific verse says you cannot sleep with a married woman unless she is your captive. Now, does that sound consensual? Absolutely not. Muslims will tell you, you're reading that out of context. Not a problem. Let's look at the Hadith. So before we look at the Hadith, well, let's look at the gradings of the Hadith. When you read Hadith, it's important to understand that most Hadiths have a grading. So the first grading is Sahih, which means sound. These are reliable and does not contradict orthodox beliefs. The most trusted and the most accepted Hadiths are said to be Sahih, which means sound. Next, we have Hassan, which means good hadith. Hadiths that contain all incomplete sanat, approved authorities or support, or written by transmitters with questionable authority. And then we have da'if, which means weak. Da'if hadith are hadith that contain text that is subject to serious criticism, or hadith written by someone who is subject to serious criticism. Therefore, you see the hierarchy, so it's sahih, Hassan and Da'if. Let's look at our first hadith that talks about this verse right here that we just read. This is Sahih al Bukhari, 6130, Book 78, Hadith 157. What's the grading? Sahih. This is a strong, sound hadith, according to Muslims. It reads Abu Sa'i al Qudri said, The Apostle of Allah, peace be upon him, sent a military expedition to Aswas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah, peace be upon him, were reluctant to have sexual relations with the female captives because of their pagan husbands. So Allah, the exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hand possess. This is to say that they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. So this is a sound hadith telling you that Muhammad led this military expedition. The men, being away from their, um, being away from their wives and their houses, wanted to feel some type of intimacy. But they were reluctant to do it with these women because they knew it was a sin because those women were not their, were not their wives. However, Allah sent Muhammad a verse that says, oh, no, it is okay. It is my creed to you that because you possess them, technically it is okay for you to do so. 
Now, if that doesn't sound man-made, I don't know. Now, let's continue. In Islam, is it allowed for a husband to beat his wife? This is chapter 4, verse 34. It reads, men are caretakers of women. Since Allah has made some of them excel the others, and because of the wealth they have spent, so the righteous women are obedient and guard the property and honor of their husbands in their absence with the protection given by Allah. As for women of whom you fear rebellion, convince them and leave them apart in beds and beat them lightly. Then if they obey you, do not seek a way against them. Surely Allah is the highest, the greatest. So one of the brethren and I were talking about Quran translations earlier. Whenever you're reading English translations, you will see these words in parentheses. So for example, this one says, and beat them lightly. Whenever you see a word in a parentheses in the Quran, that means when you read the Arabic in which that's the original language it was written, that word does not exist in the Arabic. It is added for your understanding. So you may say, why are you guys adding to your scripture? Why are you putting words in there? Many Muslims will tell you, oh, although the word lightly does not appear in the Quran, it is implied that when you beat your wife, you beat her lightly. You don't want to kill your wife. You have to beat it, do her lightly. That's understandable. But let's go see what the Hadith says. This is Sahih al-Bukhari 5825, book 77, Hadith 42. What is the grading? Sahih. This is a sound Hadith. It reads, Raphael divorced his wife, whereupon Abu Rahman bin Azubad al-Khuzri married her. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to her, Aisha, of her husband and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by beating. It was the habit of the ladies to support each other. So when Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. When Abu Rahman heard that his wife had gone to the prophet, he came with his two sons from another wife. She said, by Allah, I have done no wrong to him, but he is impotent and is as useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. Abu Rahman said, by Allah, O Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she is disobedient and wants to go back to Raphaia. Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, said to her, if that is your attention, then you know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Raphaia unless Abu Bakr has had sexual intercourse with you. Then the prophet, peace be upon him, saw two boys with Abu Rahman and asked him, are these your sons? On that, Abu Rahman said, yes. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, you claim what you claim, i.e. that he is impotent, but by Allah, these boys resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. So to break down the context, there was a gentleman who has a wife. He is not able to satisfy her in the bedroom. So she goes back and tells him, like, I want to go back to my other husband. He gets angry and hits her. He hits her so hard that she has a green bruise on her body. That does not sound like a light beating. She goes and talks to Aisha, who is the wife of the prophet, and says, look at this bruise. He hit me. Aisha tells her husband, who is the prophet, Allah, I mean, a prophet Muhammad, this lady has suffered great, greatly. As a matter of fact, look at her green dress. That bruise is the same color as that, as that dress. And when Allah asks why, did, were you hit? And she said, I told my husband he couldn't satisfy me in bed, so he hit me. The husband comes back and says, surely I can satisfy you. I'm strong. I can do it. You just want to go back to your old husband. If, if, if it was the case that you can only beat her lightly, why did Muhammad not condemn Rahman for leaving a green bruise on her body? Aisha said this lady was suffering. That does not sound like a light beating. Let's look at another one. This is uh, Wahidi Azbab al-Nuzam by al-Wahidi. It reads, men are in charge of women, 434. Sayyid Mukatel, this verse, men are in charge of women, was re revealed about Sayyid ibn al-Rabi, who was one of the leaders of the helpers, Nukuba, and his wife, Habiba, bint Zayid ibn Abu Zar. I know, guys, I can't speak these names either. <laughs> Both of whom, from the helpers, it happened Sayyid hit his wife on the face because she rebelled against him. Then her father went with her to see the prophet. Allah bless him and give him peace. He said to him, 
I gave him my daughter in marriage, and he slapped her. The prophet Allah blessed him and gave him peace, said, let her have retaliation against her husband. As she was leaving with her father to execute retaliation, the prophet, Allah blessed him and gave him peace, called him and said, come back. Gabriel has come to me, and Allah exalted is he revealed this verse. The messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, said, we wanted something while Allah wanted something else. And that which Allah wants is good, retaliation was then suspended. So when you look at the context of this hadith, they're asking, where did this verse come from? A lady and her dad went to see the prophet. The dad said, hey, I gave my daughter's hand in marriage to this man, and he beat her. He hit her upside the face. Muhammad says, let's go get retaliation. You guys go get retaliation. So as they were walking out, the angel Gabriel came down from heaven and said, Muhammad, no, I'm going to send you this verse from Allah. This verse says it's okay to hit your woman, your wife. So Muhammad chases them down and says, hey, I know what I said before, and I still stand by that, but Allah wanted something different. So Allah said it's okay for you to do so, therefore don't get retaliation. If that doesn't sound man-made like the first one, I don't know. Muhammad's marriage to six-year-old Aisha. Also, guys, if you guys ever have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand as well. I know I tend to speak fast. Yes, sir. I'm seeing the Hadith references here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, websites, uh, if you go to sunnah.com, S-U-N-N-A-H.com. And then on the end of uh, each one, on many of them, it says grading. Yes. Are they graded in that? Yes, uh, yes in sunnah.com. Yes. And then uh, you can just go to the library or Library of Congress or any website or just order a Hadith collection. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari is one of the biggest collections, the most trusted collections. Uh, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Tafsir, there are many, like, notable Hadith collections. Yes, sir. Yeah, so no, well, that came from Sooner.com. They didn't have a grading on it. But, um, oh, so if you look at the references, one of those references at the bottom says it came from somebody like, and we look at the translators, somebody with a Hassan. See that red word that says Hassan? It says Al Hassan. So, therefore, that's an indication that it's a good Hadith because it says Hassan. So, now let's talk about Muhammad's marriage to six-year-old Aisha. Yes, sir. So, that's uh, Raman has two sons. And basically, the whole situation was he could not satisfy her in bed. He wasn't able to uh, be strong enough for her. And Muhammad says... I know you're a lying woman because he has two children and they look just like him. So he must have been able to satisfy somebody. So why can't he satisfy you? So this hadith is a complete different hadith from this one. This is the hadith where Gabriel came down. So this hadith had nothing to do with Gabriel, but what this hadith does do is it shows us that a beating is not a light beating, because if it was a light beating, she would not have a scar. So whereas this hadith is telling us where this verse came from. We don't know. Even Muslims don't know. Yeah, if you ask them when were these written, they, they wouldn't know. They knew it was written years after Muhammad, but we don't know. Yes, sir. All right, so 54-year-old Muhammad married a 6-year-old girl named Aisha. Some, some sources in the Hadith say he married her at 6, and he consummated the marriage at 9, which means he made the marriage official through sexual intercourse. Let's read about it. Argument number one, when you bring this up to Muslims, hey, why did Muhammad marry a 6-year-old? This is what they'll say. That's how things were done back then. This is one of the first arguments that they will throw out to justify that what, they, um, what Muhammad did was right. So if this is how things were done back then, why did Muhammad tell Abu Bakr that his daughter Fatima, who's, eight, who's that age we do not know, but we conclude she was between the ages of 9 and 19, 
because of where she was born. Like, they said she was born between 605 AD and 615 AD, according to the Hadith. Therefore, we know she's in between the ages of 9 to 19, which means she's older than Aisha. However, when she decides to, uh, when Abu Bakr wants to propose to her, Muhammad says, hey, bro, she's too young. You can't, you can't marry her. She's too young. So I thought that was a, a custom in their culture back then. Let's look at the Hadith. This is Sunan An-Nusayi, 322, Book 26, Hadith 26. Uh, whoever asked me the question about where to find the Hadiths, I give you the title of all the Hadiths. If you just type in the title, you can pop right up to any Muslim source. So, It was narrated from Abdullah bin Baraba that his father said, Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, proposed marriage to Fatima. But the messenger of Allah said, she is too young. So wait a second, she's older than Aisha. Does that mean Aisha is also too young? That's a question we must ask ourselves. What's the grading for that? Sahi. Argument number two, child marriage was an ancient practice that no longer happens. This is one of the second arguments they'll bring up. So they try to make it is that it's just an ancient practice that no longer happens, but also the Quran says that Muhammad is an example for people of all of humanity from the past, present, and future. They say Muhammad is the perfect example. So if Muhammad is the perfect example of all time, what would that mean today if we follow his example in that regard? Also, and if Allah is all-knowing, wouldn't he have known that little girls could not be physically, I mean, could be physically and psychologically hurt from being penetrated by grown men? Why didn't he have Muhammad put a stop to it like he put a stop to adoption? So this is a side note, a little off topic. We'll get more into it in a couple weeks in a different lesson. But Muhammad put a, uh, he abolished adoption, the practice of adopting children as your own. The reason being is because Muhammad had an adopted son. So one day when Muhammad was going to visit his son, his son wasn't home, and he just happened to be looking through the window while his son's wife was there. And he said, because of Allah's will, the window curtain blew open, and he saw her naked. And he said, he lusted after her, he said, Allah, this is sinful, I must leave. He said when he left, Allah received some revelation and says, hey, like, it's okay for you to see that. I wanted you to see that because I want you to take her as your wife. Muhammad says, I can't do that. That's my, that's my son's wife. So his son said, hey, you're the, you're the holy prophet. I'm going to divorce her so you can have her. So Muhammad said, okay, I don't want to do it, but Allah said it's okay for me to do so. So he, he marries her. And people, the general population, said, they, they ridicule him. Why are you marrying the ex-wife of your son? That's, that's creepy. So what he says was, oh, well, he's not really my son because he's adopted. But Allah said, he, Allah doesn't want anybody to suffer this type of embarrassment that I'm feeling right now. So therefore, Allah puts a stop to adoption so that none of you ever have to feel this embarrassment I'm feeling. So like I said, we're going to get more into that later on. But yeah, so if Muhammad puts a stop to adoption because they thought it was bad, how come he didn't put a stop to this? And Allah's all knowing. He knows that marrying children is bad. But also, why is this still taking place today if it's an ancient practice. Paul, can I get that video, please? We're back with our worldly now and a distressing story out of Afghanistan showing the harsh reality of the humanitarian crisis engulfing the country, especially post-Taliban rule, desperate families so impoverished they tell CNN they have no choice but to sell their young daughters into some twisted form of marriage. In this exclusive report, CNN witnesses the tragic fate facing these helpless little girls in this culture where girls and women are too often treated horrifically. The parents gave us full access and permission to talk to the children and show their faces because they say they cannot change the practice themselves. CNN's Anna Corrin reports. In this arid, desolate landscape, not a scrap of vegetation in sight, lies a makeshift camp for some of Afghanistan's internally displaced. <laughs> Among its residents, nine-year-old Pawana. Her bright pink dress squeals of laughter and childhood games, a ruse to the horrors unfolding in this unhospitable environment. Pawana's family moved to this camp in Baghdis province four years ago after her father lost his job. 
Humanitarian aid and menial work, earning $3 a day, providing the basic staples to survive. But since the Taliban takeover two and a half months ago, any money or assistance has dried up. And with eight mouths to feed, Pawana's father is now doing the unthinkable. I have no work, no money, no food. I have to sell my daughter, he says. I have no other choice. Pawana, who dreams of going to school and becoming a teacher, applies makeup. A favorite pastime for little girls, but Pawana knows she is preparing for what awaits her. My father has sold me because we don't have bread, rice, and flour. He has sold me to an old man. The white bearded man who claims he's 55 years old comes to collect her. He's bought Parwana for 200,000 Afghanis, just over 2,000 US dollars. Covered up, Parwana whimpers as her mother holds her. This is your bride. Please take care of her, says Pawana's father. Of course I will take care of her, replies the man. His large hands grab her small frame. Pawana tries to pull away. As he carries her only bag of belongings, she again resists. Thank digging you, her heels into the dirt. That's enough, Paul. But it's futile. So as you can see, the gentleman in the white beard who was going to uh, pick up this young lady to be his wife, he is not trying to be discreet about it. He is not trying to hide his face. He is not trying to uh, be low key. And the reason being is because what he is doing is 100% legal where they are from. Because Afghanistan, I believe that's the country where they were, that is a country that is governed by the Quran. So if the Quran makes it okay and it's legal in the Quran, it's legal in life. So as you can see, this is not an ancient practice. This still goes on today. Unless somebody wants to say this video was taken hundreds of years ago, which I don't think we had the technology to do it back then. Um, I'm not a parent. Uh, I, I, I want to be a parent one day. And I, uh, I don't know what I would do if a 54-year-old man would ask me if he can take my six-year-old daughter's hand in marriage. I'd probably sucker punch him or something. Yes, sir. It's a lot, yes sir. Thank you for sharing that anecdotal experience. So you, you've seen firsthand how a, a, a grown man was able to marry a 12 year old, understand. Did you have a question, sir? Okay, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there are many hadith. I didn't quote them because they are daif, but it says, oh, the age of consent for that little girl is once she's able to bear penetration and without being physically harmed too much. So it, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's sickening to think about. Did I see a hand over here? All right. Yes, sir. So according to the Quran, uh, a Muslim man is uh, stricted to four wives, unless you're Muhammad, because since Muhammad is the holy apostle, he can have as many wives as he wants. But everybody else, only four. So, Argument number three, she was very mature for her age, which made it okay. So they try to argue she was very mature, that uh, being adult was basically based off your level of maturity. Then why did she narrate her Quran to say, I was six when the prophet married me, and I used to play with dolls at his house? What mature woman plays with dolls? Here's the hadith. What's the grading? Sahi. It reads, I used to play with dolls in the presence of the prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves. But the prophet would call them to join and play with me. 
The playing with dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. So they say, well, yeah, well, she was, she was mature for her age. Um, if any of you are parents or grandparents and you have little, little girls, you know, when they're little, they play with dolls. Eventually, they want to get into fashion and makeup and other things, and the dolls go away. They're starting to mature. So why is this little girl still playing with dolls if she was mature? Yes, ma'am. The handle was made in a sexual way. Absolutely. It's sickening to think about. Argument number three. She was technically an adult. Hmm. How could she technically be an adult? Some Muslims would try to argue that Aisha was an adult because she had her period already. First of all, there is nowhere in the Quran or the Hadith that it says she had had her period. As a matter of fact, this Hadith says she has not yet reached the age of puberty, and this is a Sahih Hadith. But let's just say what they said was right. Yeah, she had her period. Okay, cool. Then why does the Quran give us instructions on how to divorce your wife who is too young to have a period, a.k.a. a child? The verse reads, this is uh, chapter 65, verse 4. And those who no longer expect menstruation among your women, if you doubt, then their period is three months. And also for those who have not menstruated and for those who are pregnant, their term is until they give birth. And whoever fears Allah, he will make for him of his matter. So this whole entire chapter is about divorce, how to divorce, how not to divorce. In this chapter, it talks about something called an idda. An idda is a waiting period. So the reason for a waiting period is because if you divorce your wife today and she remarries, let's say, next week, and her and her husband consummate the marriage through sexual intercourse and she becomes pregnant, you had her last week. For all you know, that could be your baby or the new husband's baby. They didn't have the type of technology that we have today that can, you can do DNA testing. So therefore, the idda was a three-month period where you, you could not touch your wife, and she had to wait three months. During those three months, she had to have three cycles. If she's had three cycles, that means she wasn't pregnant, and you can divorce her peacefully and let her go and to, uh, to see whoever else she wants to see. So this particular verse, Muhammad said, yeah, she, they have to have three months. They have to have three periods. The people, the people ask him, but Muhammad, some of our women are above the age of menstruation and no longer have their periods. What should their waiting period be? Muhammad says, oh, it should still be three months. But Muhammad, some of our wives are too young to have their periods. What should their waiting period be? Oh, well, their, their waiting period should still be three months, as you can see here. So that's the full context of that verse right there, correct? So many Muslims will tell you, when you read 65.4, they say, oh, it doesn't indicate that you sexually, I mean, you sexually touch that child. It just means that you are married to them. Oh, really? Well, let's go read the Quran, because the Quran falls on its face. When you try to attack the Bible, the Bible will defend itself. But when you try to attack the Quran, it's going to fall on his face. Let's look at chapter 33, verse 49. It says, O believers, if you marry believing women and then divorce them before you touch them, they will have no waiting period for you to count. So give them a suitable compensation and let them go graciously. So this verse right here tells us, hey, their waiting period is three months if you want to divorce them. This one says, if you hadn't touched them, they don't need a waiting period. So when this one indicates that the person who you're married to is too young to have their period, but you have to let them wait three months before you divorce them, this verse right here says, if you didn't touch them, she doesn't need a waiting period. So it's safe to say that these verses are indicating that that person was being touched. Argument number four. The Bible teaches the same thing. How so? Many anti-Christian websites created by Muslims and maybe uh, atheists and other people who don't like Christians as well, they state that God allowed Moses to have little girls. You may ask, what makes them think that? Let's look at this verse right here. Numbers 31, 18. But keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. Now, when you read that, and if you're not a Bible, Bible study, which is very important for us to dive into the word, you're like, Wow. God is telling them to have all these young girls. But this is the problem. Sometimes people will give you the text without giving you the context. And if they give you the text without the context, that means they are hiding the fact that they are a con. So it's important for us to have the context and not just be a con from the text. When you read the full verse, it says, And Moses said to them, 
Have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known a man intimately. But keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. So in full context, when you read a couple chapters uh, earlier, I believe like chapter 24 or maybe 26, don't quote me on that, uh, the sons of Israel were going to these places and they, they seemed like these women. And these women were basically enticing these men with sexual orgies. And the byproduct of them uh, having sexual orgies with these men was that the men decided to worship uh, Baal and Peor and the other false gods. So God, out of his wrath, says, hey, put a stop to all that. Put a stop to those men who had those sexual orgies. Put a stop to those women. But save the women, the girls who had not known a man because they're innocent. So save their lives. Save their lives. They are innocent. So only a sick and twisted human being will look at this verse and say, oh, he's telling Muhammad to save them for himself, for his own pleasure. No, he's telling, he's telling Moses to save their life because they are innocent. They had no dealings with what was going on with those sexual orgies and the false worship of false gods and idols. All right, so that appears to be the final slide that we have for today. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. And also next week, we'll be talking about a lot of the scientific miracles of the Quran and compare those to the Bible. Yes, sir. So, um, yes, there are, a lot, there are limits to four wives. Uh, a lot of like traditional like Sunni Muslims say, yeah, you're limited to four wives, but you have to have a reason to need those four wives. So, for example, let's say one of your wives is missing uh, an arm, Lord forbid, and she can't cook for you, then you have to go marry someone who can cook. So some traditional Sunni Muslims will tell you that's the reason for having four wives, whereas other Muslims will tell you, oh, well, Allah knows that you're a man and, and you want diversity and you want to be able to uh, have other women. So therefore, that's the reason why you have those four wives. So yes, if you want to uh, have another one, they say, yeah, you just divorce her and get another one. But they also have something called muta. So what muta is, it's a practice where when you see somebody and you want to have sexual relations with them, but you know it's a sin if you don't do it um, through marriage, what you do is something called muta. And muta is a temporary marriage where you sign a marriage contract for, let's say the, the contract is for seven hours or seven days or just a couple days or whatever. You sleep with that woman and then once you're done, the contract is void and you're no longer married. So technically it's a, it's a legal loophole for sleeping with women. It's called muta. That's like one of their practices. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have to treat them all equal. You have to provide for them the same. Uh, you have to be able to, uh, if, if you're financially providing for one, you have to be able to prov financially provide for all. So if you can only afford one, you can't have more than one. Yes, sir. Interesting. Thank you for that. All right. Do we have any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to me today. Um, we are about five minutes early, so I will stick around for Q&A or if anybody wants to chat. But other than that, you guys are dismissed.